and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV along with Ronnie Dahl. In addition today, as always, we are on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and on Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the village of Franklin, as well as today online on civiccentertv.com, as we always are, and on Facebook via Facebook Live. Today, we are on the Facebook page of Ronnie Dahl. Oh, well, how fun is that? Yes, a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so one thing I've been noticing, Tyler, is so Facebook, and I really don't understand why they don't change this, but back in the day, they put you as a limit of 5,000. So, um, and, and I, again, I don't know why. So then they came up with these public pages. So at one time when I was working at Channel 7, you tried to merge the two. It was a hot mess. It was just a hot mess. So it was easier for people to do two separate pages. So you have like a, a you know, private page as a regular person, and then you do a public page. But one thing I will notice, um, or that I have noticed, especially since doing um, this show even more, when you do things on your public page, if you do not advertise or pay for advertisement, they do not send out your post. People are not getting them. So if I, I could post the same thing on my um, you know regular private page versus the public page, oh, yeah. and you get so much more interaction, which is just their way of saying, hey, give us some money. Of course, yeah. They, they want the ad dollars to get people to to get the traffic continuing to flow to your videos if you're not in your in your other posts if you're not getting traction right away they're just gonna go away after a little bit that's why uh when i was in when i was in college we always had a mandate at uh msu telecasters which was the student uh, ran tv programming we did on like youtube and stuff that we would only post we would post videos by uploading them because apparently in their algorithm at the time, and I think still now, if you actually upload videos directly to Facebook, it'll stay up there a little longer than posting a link where that link, if you're not getting clicks right away, it's going away. They got all these weird algorithms that don't make any sense. They change them all the time, and it's all about funneling in, of course, the ad dollars, as you say. <laughs> Right. It's all about the almighty dollar. Oh, yes. But with that, happy Monday, everyone. Happy Monday, Tyler. How was your weekend? It was good. It was a good weekend. Nice, relaxed, calm weekend, which was a, which was a nice change. You got out a little bit, went for a nice walk in the in the woods up in the, up in the um, some of the nature parks in the in the Wixom area and around Kensington. That was really nice. That's awesome. So I have a friend. Um, they went up north and they were doing like hiking uh, up north with the ice. Okay. Um, I forget the name of the area, but uh, it, but it's way up north, so it's not someplace we can go just locally. But her pictures are amazing, like hiking through the woods and then doing the ice climbing on the waterfalls. And it is so on my bucket list. That with uh, seeing the northern lights, which yeah. right now are pretty good too up north. Yeah, yeah, so far they're looking looking pretty good, and then uh, yeah, a lot a lot of really nice sights to see during the winter in Michigan up up north. It's cold. It's it's freezing cold when you go up there, but some of the sights that you can see in in the warmer months are even more breathtaking. It, it seems in the colder months of the year, just because of the snow and and the visuals that you get in that you only will get in winter in northern Michigan. <laughs> but with that, you get winter. Yeah, you do. In northern Michigan. Exactly. It's a which is a little bit harsher than the uh, winter we're getting here. Of course. But we're still, uh, it, it, you know, at this point in time in the year, lay off Mother Nature. Of course. We're you know, done. So we, we, we get it. Right? It's, we understand. You're, 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 we've been making fun of you all winter. Oh, look! Oh, not too bad. Oh, where's where's winter gone the last few years? And then you come back and you slap us across the face with some serious snowstorms, a couple here and there. Okay, we get it. We get it. Winter happens. <laughs> and look, we're done. Exactly. We're done. So, uh, and, and and of course, my dog wanted to go out like uh, first it. 2.30 this morning, awesome. and then again, like 6, 6.30, I don't know, and just wants to play. You know, you right. when you have a, a pet, any pet owner can kind of relate to this, or especially dog owners, and your uh, pet comes up, hmm, 
<laughs> oh yeah. And then they hit you. <laughs> Hit you again, <laughs> like with a big paw. Okay, I get it. So sometimes, Tyler, uh, my husband's not watching, so I'm okay to say this. I pretend like I'm sleeping. And I just wait. <laughs> it's like a game. It's a waiting game. Who is going to wait the longest to pretend like they're sleeping? Because I know he's pretending too. Of course. Because he hears her. <laughs> the first one ups, that's, it's, it's, it's over. It's your turn. I'm telling you. So, with that though, uh, yeah, a little bit crazy out on the roads this morning. Uh, because d a different snow though. Yeah, a little it, it's a little bit heavier, a little bit rainier. But now we're going to be getting 40 degree temperatures. Ran into my neighbor today walking her dog at six in the morning, and we were like, "This is like a heat wave out here," and it was like 20. And now it's like 25 on Friday, and it was uh, it was pretty warm as, as I'm driving home. I went to go get a haircut, and someone's coming into. Uh, the Great Clips location that I went to, and it's like, yeah, it's it's really warm out here. It's like 30 degrees, and I was saying, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna go jump in the lake after this. It's a real nice day. Which would be a better day for all the people that do that uh, polar lake plunge, which yeah. is usually in January. They really need to uh, switch it. Uh, anyway, so hey, a lot to get to. I hope everyone out there had a great weekend. They go by so quickly so quickly oh, yes. but uh while we're here let's go ahead and the big discussion it is monday but for some school districts here uh they have called snow delays which um it really has to be an interesting time to be a superintendent a teacher making these uh these calls because what is a snow delay when you're already only working or going to school half days, right, because of the virtual platform. But the CDC has set uh, a new high bar for Michigan schools to resume in-person learning. So if you want to click over to Civic Center TV and check out the latest headlines, despite a sense of urgency to return students to the classroom, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has set a high bar for how to do it safely amid the pandemic. How many months are we into this? And we're just getting this. Okay. So the new CDC guidelines come as parents and educators in many Michigan communities are engaged in intense debate over reopening schools. Federal agencies says schools can open safely if they put layered mitigation measures in place and offer a roadmap based on the surrounding community's rate of COVID-19 transmission. CDC guidance, which is not a mandate, it is simply a recommendation, calls for hybrid learning models in the majority of counties across Michigan and closing down secondary schools and counties with the highest community, or, uh, community transmission. I'm sitting here and I'm like, if you are these school leaders, you have to be scratching your head every single day. Yeah. Um, uh, number one here, the president, uh, his one of his first statements, uh, President Biden was, I want kids back in school. Governor, Ret Governor Gretchen Whitmer, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that, uh, Whitmer, she, all of a sudden, she's the one who closed the schools. Now she reopens them. She wants every school district to be offering some type of in-person by March 1st. That date line, pretty close. Um, but w where were these guidelines? So now you have all of these individuals and these superintendents making all these huge you know, sacrifices and decisions and now a lot of their decisions don't line up with the CDC's guidelines. And for those wondering, like there's a huge list. And so we put a link to that list too, by the way, on the CDC um, website. So where are you if you're a superintendent making these decisions? Because I think one thing everyone can agree upon is that yes, uh, kids need to be in class. They are losing so much education during this time. How do you get there? And what is the best policy and the best way to do it? Very confusing. Yeah, it's gonna take a while for, for these school districts to really get a hang of this because they have been working on these return to learn plans month to month, day by day, week by week since the beginning of this pandemic. I mean, just tonight, I know on the West Bloomfield School District Board of Education's 
uh, agenda for tonight's meeting, they're going to be discussing their return to learn plan, which may have been very different last week when they did their study session, when they made the plans for tonight's uh, school board meeting than they will be when they discuss it tonight, maybe because of these CDC guidelines. And as you said, it's a long list. I mean, we'll click on the article again. We'll put it back up on the screen for those of you watching at home and those that can watch on demand later on civiccentertv.com. I mean, in the time that it that it took for Ronnie to just review the basics of that article, I maybe scrolled down a third of the way of the page, and that only got us to the background section. So there's a lot of details here, a lot that the school districts are going to have to work out to align themselves with the CDC guidelines, which is something that they have been aiming to do, have been aiming to be in line with the CDC and with the state of Michigan's guidelines and, pr and principles of having in-person learning because they know in-person learning is much more effective than the online learning for the vast majority of the students. And while some will continue to thrive virtually, there has been a lot of learning loss that has been seen and found by educators during this pandemic. Ugh. I'm just so glad that I'm a pet parent, yeah. I will say. Um, and uh, my niece and nephew, uh, they are in a college so a college has their own struggles but we also know it's a different dynamic because they are older as well um it is such it's just tough it's so tough for parents and the educators as well because there's two sides to um every issue with this hey uh so we've talked a lot on the show here tyler about unemployment fraud well michigan's unemployment insurance agency estimates the state paid hundreds of millions of dollars in unemployment fraud in 2020. Keep in mind, that's our tax dollars. But so far has found only about 93 million in overpayments and recovered about 47 million in 2020. Federal government is sending money to 28 states, including here in Michigan, to help fund unemployment fraud. Michigan did receive about 2.5 million already in August, another 2.5 million this month to search for fraud and hopes of recovering some of that money, which is our money. Mm -hmm. uh, nearly all of the 2.5 million is going towards staffing and some funds are also going toward technology needs to help track down some of these fraudsters. Yeah, we saw it back in uh, the earlier parts of the pandemic when unemployment fraud was running so rampant was having an effect on people being able to get their unemployment checks altogether because the process was so slowed down to decipher what was fraud and what was a legitimate need. And uh, having some help from the federal government to find those unemployment fraud cases and narrow them down and hopefully resolve these issues and make it easier for the states to be able to get their unemployment funds to people in need as this pandemic continues on. Hopefully that's going to happen. Hundreds of millions of dollars, as it said in this article on civiccentertv.com, were lost, uh, were taken away from Michigan, and a majority of that was from federal funding. So hopefully this is uh, some so sort of a resolution to that, and we don't have further issues with unemployment, because this pandemic's not going away anytime soon, and people are still really struggling to stay afloat. Yeah, and you know what's sad is we all know people that really need the help and they can't get yeah. the help because the system is so broken. Uh, it, mismanagement, at the end of the day, it's mismanagement and um, we're so used to it uh, too, which sadly um, we don't, you know, do protest or, or demand change because we're like, yeah, it's the way the government's run. Yeah, earlier on in the pandemic, we talked to Taylor DeSormo from M Live, and we also talked to a University of Michigan expert about the unemployment issues at that time. And even they both said, before these issues, the system that the Unemployment Insurance Agency in Michigan was using <clears throat> in order to file unemployment was already heavily flawed and prone to issues before this and would flag things down that had no business being flagged down, would delay things that had no business being delayed. And this fraud issue only caused more issues with unemployment with the unemployment insurance agency and caused further delays at a time where so many more people needed those unemployment benefits. It really is sad all around. Uh, hey, uh, there is a little bit of good news. Start off this Monday. 
our uh, coronavirus cases here in the state of Michigan continue to decline. So the new coronavirus cases are on the decline as state health leaders reported only 635 cases, 63 deaths this past weekend. New cases uh, for Saturday, one of the lowest daily totals in the last two weeks with only uh, February 9th coming in lower with just 563 cases. But really anything under 1,000, we're like, wow, this is awesome. Uh, Michigan now has a total of 579,919 confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases since the beginning of the pandemic nearly a year ago. And sadly, we have lost so many people, over 15,000 people here in the state of Michigan have uh, died due to the pandemic. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I do know that uh, I know uh, several people and uh, not anyone directly, but so many acquaintances and their friends and their family members have died from this uh, virus as well. Um, but the good news on Friday, 37,983 people here in the state of Michigan, Tyler. They were tested for COVID-19. It came back with a 3.11% positivity rate. So for those you may not remember, the positivity rate, um, according to the health department, anything less than 3% is a good indication that the virus spread is under control. So we're getting there, but we know that number can will jump wildly as um, things start to reopen as well. State reports uh, data on the coronavirus recoveries once a week. So as of Friday, uh, more than 529,000 people here in the state of Michigan have also recovered since the beginning of the pandemic, which is good. So. Um, I think as we continue on with this virus and, and how they're tracking it and figuring things out, you are going to see we now know how to treat it more as well, which is a great thing. Um, and plus we have the vaccine. So hopefully that's going to get us back to a life as we once knew it. Do you remember life? <laughs> Barely. I've had very vaguely remember what life was like pre-pandemic I'm just I, I even just watching things that had happened back back then or just seeing old uh, old clips from sporting events or just public events that were happening and seeing people in close proximity to each other I get a little anxious like what are you doing you people are way too close to one another we might as well just all be coughing in each other's mouths what are we doing here and now <laughs> 11 months later everybody if you're not at a you know 10 foot distance they're looking at you cross-eyed so one of the funny things about that though tyler because i was talking with some friends over the weekend and um you look at it and you go before the virus even once we get back to the point it's going to take a long time for people to be comfortable being around strangers i'm not going to be that person i'm going to be the one that's coming up to everyone i will talk to you in the line at the grocery store i will talk to you at the line of the starbucks so get ready i'm having a conversation with you especially if i can do it without a mask yeah i'm, I'm gonna have to give the same warning i tend to be the kind of person that i'm not really that obnoxious until you've known me for a little bit but i'm gonna be very obnoxious to <laughs> everybody around me after this i'm itching to just interact with people again like is normal it's just it, it's been so long i think it is going to be a big adjustment for a lot of people coming out of the pandemic just to get back to that comfort level and and really figuring out what that interaction is in a post COVID-19 world I miss people yeah I so miss people my husband on the other side and uh, despite what he does for a living he's actually a very he's kind of an introvert so um, I'm always like hey my girlfriends are coming over and he's like well they have to stay outside in the backyard well we're not really doing that in the winter time he's okay without uh, having people come to our house. The only, uh, my twin sister and my niece during this entire, and my brother to take our Christmas picture, they've been the only ones in our house since this pandemic. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of on the same page as Woody. I'm not someone that's like clamoring normally to have interaction with other people. It's like, if it's there, it's there. If it's not, I can live without it. But just the circumstances of the pandemic have made me be itching for socializing so much more that I think after the pandemic, at least initially, I'm gonna be insufferable. Well, you know the good thing during the pandemic? 
we did not have a shortage of our favorite chips. That's true. Uh, That's true. Better made chips coming up on the Monday edition of the Mega Cast. We are going to have with us the vice president of purchasing for Better Made snack chips. Uh, so, Tyler, I come from Ohio. Yeah. And uh, ball rights are made in my hometown, so it's always a huge discussion, which is better. Ball rights are oh, better made. Let's we'll settle that so, debate. Uh, that, they'll be on the show today. Our first guest will also be speaking with the Friends of the uh, Rouge. Uh, so many of us now. Tyler also spending a lot of time outdoors. Uh, in the 11 o'clock hour, Alliance of the Coalitions, um, because overdose uh, deaths are on the rise right now, sadly, we'll be uh, speaking with them about one quick little kit that you can have in your possession to help save a life of someone. Detroit, uh, the Detroit Historical Society will also be here, and we will also be speaking um, with our last guest, who I'm excited to talk to him about the furniture designer yeah. uh, for a local furniture company who was also on HGTV um, on one of their competitions. So a great show for you here on this Monday coming up after the break. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19 to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. for taking time out of your Monday to be with us here on the Megacast. Think about this, Tyler. 90 years. For 90 years, Better Made Snack Foods has been selling tasty treats to dedicated chip fans. I'm one of them. Not for 90 years, though. Uh, but how is business during the pandemic? Talk about that and so much more. Let's go ahead and bring in Phil Gusman. He's the vice president of purchasing for Better Made Snack Foods. Thank you for being with us. Hey, thank you for having me. Okay, let's talk uh, about the most important thing. When are you bringing back your uh, chocolate covered potato chips but no dark chocolate so chocolate covered potato chips are like a seasonal hit that we do and they usually start in october and we order a, a set amount and when they're gone they're gone and so you're gonna probably have to wait till october of next year why can't you make that a yearly thing they are so good well we could but the problem is is they melt <laughs> eh. uh. You know, we it. get we get to where we get. Um, that you know, we use such a nice chocolate that at some point, uh, you know, you put them in the back of a, a truck or to, for delivery, you end up with one big chocolate-covered potato chip chunk. 
<laughs> and, uh, people don't people don't like that so much. No, but they are absolutely fanta- uh, fantastic. In fact, uh, I usually uh, buy them. I, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you uh, act, uh, there's a store. You can go to the factory there in Detroit, and you have that store in the you know in the front of the building. You can go in and buy them, and I send them out as holiday gifts. Yeah, that actually goes over really well. There's a lot of people that do that. Uh, we do corporate gifts with them. Uh, it, it has almost become, it has kind of like a cult following. So in October, we have it's the, the phone calls start. We actually have had to start putting updates out on our website saying, all right, they'll be here October 10th, October 10th, get ready, October 10th. And so uh, we get like up all this pent up uh, demand and then you know the floodgates open and people just go crazy so phil i have to say the other big uh following that you guys have kind of a cult following as well those rainbow chips i'm not down with those but people love them so you either love them or you hate them and that's okay um you know everybody has their own tastes and what happens in those rainbow chips is there's a it's a higher sugar content and so when they cook, the, the sugar caramelizes, and so you get that, that flavor. You almost think about it, it's like sauteing onions or mushrooms at your house. And as you cook them, they, 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 that sugar converts to, to, uh, you know, to a caramelized state. And so that's really what you end up with. So, Phil, I, I thought they were leftover chips. <laughs> I thought I read that somewhere before, but no. No, we actually have developed a, a variety of potato through uh, Michigan potato industry that meets the needs and has a little higher sugar content. So uh, we've actually gone out because at, at certain times of the year, you used to not be able to get them, but because of we've been able to develop this variety of potato, we're able to get them to customers year round. So with that, we have to start with the history of the company. What a dedication to the city of Detroit, because Detroit's been on a few ups and downs uh, through the decades since Better Made started its journey, but yet you remain dedicated to the city of Detroit. Why? Well, we're actually really proud to be in the city of Detroit. We've been in the city of Detroit since 1930. We've been at our current location since 1940. We are extremely proud that we employ local and we source local, as local as we possibly can. And 70% of our employees live within the city of Detroit. We pay a living wage, we offer benefits, and it's, uh, we have employees that the longest tenured employee that we had was 54 years. And so we have people that just, they enjoy working here. And, uh, you know, we, we, it's a family owned company and we try and treat people, you know, the best we can. That's so awesome. Phil uh, Gasmano with us here. He's the vice president of purchasing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna get a little frog in my throat because I haven't talked enough yet before I come on the show. Uh, you are the vice president of purchasing for better made snack foods here in the city of Detroit. And uh, how are you doing during the middle of the pandemic? Are sales up? You know, we've had our challenges. Uh, sh- sales have shifted, really. What you end up seeing is you end up having, uh, we, we've seen a, sh- a shift from less up and down the street business to more uh, grocery store business. And so what ends up happening is uh, the, just the, the volume has been pretty much the same but it's just a shift, a shift from package size to different package size. So you're going from what, larger to smaller or smaller to no, larger? No, from smaller to larger, because people are shopping more at the grocery stores than they are, you know, people aren't out to, you know, go into the party store to get a slice of pizza and a bag of chips, because they're just not out anymore. But what they're, they are doing is they're eating at home. And so people are going to the grocery store, they're buying, bigger bags, putting them in their pantry, and then, you know, getting what they need out of that at that point. Phil, it really is fascinating because it's looking at the supply chain during all of this pandemic, and so many companies have had to shift. So when you start to notice that, how do you turn things around to accommodate the public and and their changing needs? 
Well, I'll be honest, when the pandemic first started, we were so busy, we didn't even know what to do with ourselves. We were uh, just people were shopping, people were buying anything and everything that they could buy. Um, it has calmed down a lot, and I think uh, we're seeing a moderation of that. Um, we just have great employees. We have a great distribution system, and we are able to, you know, satisfy the needs of our customers through those the great employees. So Phil Gusmano with us. He's the vice president of purchasing for Better Made Snack Chips with us here on the Mega Cast. And with that, I have to say. Um, uh, Sometimes you go into a store and they don't sell better made. And I'm like, how can you do that in Michigan? But do you yeah. only sell in Michigan or are you expanding in other countries as well? Well, uh, so we sell various locations. Our primary area, we're a regional potato chip manufacturer, is Michigan. But we're in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Um, depending on, you know, where you go, you could, like, if you actually go to Las Vegas, you can find better made, uh, snack foods. Um, we're in pockets around the country and really what, it, what you end up finding is if you, if you find places where people have migrated from Michigan to, uh, you know, winterize or do however you want to look at it, there's a demand for better made. And so you end up seeing, uh, like in Florida, there's uh, their familiarity with Better Made, and uh, we do sell some some items down there too. See, so smart. Uh, so when you say Vegas, go in with uh, American Coney Island because they're in Vegas now. Team up yeah. with them. But you know, I'm from Tiffin, Ohio little tiny town in Ohio outside of Toledo and our claim to fame, Ball Wright's potato chips. Sure. And you can't get them outside of Ohio. We can't get them in here in Michigan. And so every time we cross the border, you go home, you want your ball rights. But for the years, like I lived, you know, in Carolinas and other places, every year for Christmas, I get a huge box of ball rights. So have you seen your online orders go up during this pandemic? Oh yeah, internet sales between uh, our website and Amazon have just flourished at this time. Um, people are looking for that comfort, that taste of home, and that's really where they're getting it at. Uh, so, 90 years in business now, really pretty amazing. And uh, because you want to talk about Detroit and some economic ups and downs and booms and busts, you guys have lived through all of it, but yet you stay dedicated uh, to the city and also uh, during the pandemic. So uh, you put out new flavors during this time? Yeah, um, so we've been actually working on some new popcorns. We have a barbecue cheddar uh, we have a jalapeno cheddar popcorn, and uh, see, you actually have some right there in your hand. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, yeah, and those those have worked really well for us. It's it's uh, our R and D department put those together, and uh, they're selling quite well. I will. I went to the store when I saw you were going to be a guest and uh, grabbed a couple of the small bags. But I was really looking for the um, caramel popcorn. Um, popcorn mix. Uh, the you Detroit know. mix? Yes, the Detroit mix. Yeah. And I went to uh, two or three different stores on my way here and no one had it. Well, that's unfortunate. We'll have to see what we can do about getting you some. Um, because when you go to Chicago, um, there's the company in Chicago, I forget the name of it, um, Garrett's, I think. Every time I go, I because I used to travel to Chicago quite a bit uh, for work, and so I would always pick up that popcorn to bring it back to people. But the Detroit mix is so much better. Well, thank you. We, uh, we actually, that's a, a newer item for us. And we use nothing but the best quality in there. So your your the caramel corn and the cheese corn are both uh, fantastic quality combined together. You know, a lot of people kind of cringe until they actually taste it, but it's that salty and sweet together, and people just really you know eat it up. It's like putting milk duds in your popcorn when you go to the yeah. movie theater. Absolutely. It really is. And I think you have the ratio a little bit better as well than Garrett's. But with that, what goes in to trying to come up with new flavors? 
So we have some really creative people that work here. It, it can come from those people. Uh, we've we've gotten phone calls from uh, from just customers who have said, "Hey, you should try this." Uh, it, it really, we're open to suggestions, and uh, so things come, you know, everywhere from in the in the park to out in left field and anywhere else you can find them. So I have a crazy one for you. My husband, his mother lives in Vegas, and she just sent him pig's feet. So, okay. And I was like, by the way, no, you don't eat them, but he does. And then I even throw the container out. I won't allow it to stay in the house. But what if you did like a pig's feet flavored potato chip? Hmm. Because then that would be a great compromise between my husband and I, because I would say, no, you, you can't eat pig's feet, but I can buy you pig's feet potato chips and no other marketing brand out there right now has them lays no no competition so i, I think we could probably compromise and maybe get you some pork rinds but <laughs> pig's feet potato chips uh you know they're trying to sell products ronnie they're trying to <laughs> yeah. sell things i right, try and bring people to the brand you know, it's been so great, though, having you with us here. And we want to tell everyone, support uh, Better Made, because you guys are local. And you we, employ we local people as well. And it's so important during the middle of the pandemic that we need businesses like yours to not only survive, but to th uh, thrive as well. So it's been great having you with us. Uh, I know you also supported a lot of the frontline workers, too, during the be yeah. beginning of this pandemic. Yeah. We definitely did. We we were sending uh, cases of chips out to uh, all the uh, to different hospitals, uh, first responders, and just really trying to let them know how much we appreciated the effort that they were putting in. Uh, we got great response from that. Uh, and, <coughs> excuse me. That's okay, Phil. I've been doing yeah, that I all morning. Talk. So we're we're in this together. It's that first morning because you know you wake up, you drink a little coffee, you drink a little tea, you drink a little water, but then you're not really doing a lot of talking. And you walk on the Michigan cold too, and it just dries that all out right away. It freezes it all up, and then you come back in, you're talking all morning long, and it dries you out again. I mean, it's tough, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I apologize. No, no you're no. okay. No, well, great, great first responders. Uh, we are just so thankful for everything that they've done. And we're, you know, that's the least we can do to uh, help support them. Phil Gusmano here with us on the Megacast. He's the vice president of purchasing for Better Made Snack Foods. Phil, quickly before we let you go, one of my favorite uh, places to actually buy a lot of your products was to go into the store uh, at the front of the factory there in Detroit. Uh, mm -hmm. it, is that still open to the public? We are. We. Uh, it's one of the things that you come up by our facility. You can see the windows. You can see the chips being made. And you can get any variety you want right out of our store. And that we, we, it's part of the, the, the charm of our, of our company. I, the last time I was there, uh, because a lot of times I would go and, like I said, I would buy them and make like little gift baskets from Michigan. And I would go and get, you know, your products or Sanders chocolates along with Fago Pop or something, you know, and then um, send them out to people. But with that, you had this cute, in the lobby, this huge, um, it was like this backdrop right mm -hmm. that looked like the better made potato chips that you could stand in the middle and take a picture do you still have that yeah we do it's still up there um you come on in we can we have all kinds of unique items uh from t-shirts to hats to uh playing cards with our logos and you'd be really surprised how many people are looking for that kind of stuff it's uh that that reminder of home if you will for all the people that have moved away it's our bragging right it is Hey, uh, uh, quickly before we say goodbye, though, uh, how many people uh, does your company, Better Made Snack Foods, how many do they employ here in the state of Michigan? So at our location here in Detroit, there's around 200. And then throughout the state of Michigan, there's about 400 that earn, an, earn a living from the company. It, that is fascinating that you can put out so many bags of potato chips that you do. Yeah, we put out millions of bags of potato chips a year. Um, Fun fact, we, we use over almost 700 million pounds of potatoes a year. Where do you get your potatoes? 
So once again, we talk about being local, 90% of those potatoes come from the state of Michigan. Michigan is the largest uh, chip potato growing state in the country. That is so awesome. See, it's a circle and we just support our circle. Absolutely. Well, Phil, thank you so much for being with us. We so appreciate it. You're welcome. Appreciate the time and uh, you guys have a great day. Well, we're going to dig into our jalapeno cheddar flavored popcorn. Uh, I do have regular ones though. I don't know what, I didn't know what you like, Tyler. Uh, But when it comes to like their barbecue, it's too confusing. You have like so what, many. four so or five many different variety. barbecue flavor potato chips. So yeah. so confusing. <laughs> we, we give people what they want. <laughs> well, Phil, it's been great having you, but also we want to say thank you for supporting uh, our community, not only through employment, but also everything you do for our first responders, because 11 months into this, we're not over it, and they are facing it each and every day. So I know they uh, appreciate your support as well. All right. You guys have a great day. Okay. Thank you so much again uh, to everyone out there. Buy local. When you go into the uh, food store and you're picking up your snacks for the day, buy local. Just do a little bit of extra time because you're supporting local people, putting food on the tables of those that live here in our community. So thank you to Better Made Snack Foods. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we'll be talking about Mother Nature. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, Comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. As a reminder, you can always catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. If you have cable, thank you. A portion of your fee helps support programming such as this. You can find us on Channel 15 if you have Comcast 99 on AT&T. You can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH in Bloomfield Hills. And with that, we are going to go ahead and um, how are, how's the popcorn? It's, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's very good. I'm not really a big uh, cheese flavoring guy but I do enjoy the jalapeno it's, it's got a nice little kick to it Ron and I appreciate that so we uh, as we uh, were just speaking with better maids uh, Tyler is doing a taste test for I them I and then one of their newest flavors the jalapeno cheddar cheese popcorn is it cheddar cheese or is it just it is yeah, cheese. It's cheese. It's yeah cheddar, cheddar. <laughs> yeah great stuff I, I like that but I need to be watching a movie yeah, I kind of feel the same way. You know, it's it's a nice nice action movie and a little kick from the jalapeno would work really well. Right, you know? but I wouldn't sneak it into a movie theater. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. No. I was the worst. One time I took in like an entire subway. <laughs> it wow. was crazy. Oh, man. Hey, uh, so uh, again, thank you for being with us here on the Megacast as we continue the show. Nearly a year ago, into uh, nearly a year into the COVID crisis, many have turned to Mother Nature to help us cope. I am among that group, Tyler, and it sparked a new appreciation for the beauty in our backyards, but we have not always been so kind to Mother Nature. With us now, Marie McCormick. She's the executive director, Friends of the Rouge. Always great to have you with us. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you so much for having me today. Appreciate it. And uh, all those better made chips made me feel really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you eat them before noon, the calories don't count. Okay. Keep That's that in true. mind. <laughs> I just made that up. It sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> Their taglines. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then they need to put like a little thing. It's like. Uh, they just put a disclaimer there. It can say anything with <laughs> right. a disclaimer in these days, you know? Exactly. You know what's so great, though, is um, during this time, I do really think people are starting to appreciate what is in our backyards, right? Like Mother Nature has been our savior during this time. But when it comes to the River Rouge, uh, not always uh, the best history there. How are cleanup efforts going right now? Well, the Rouge River has been um, going through over 50 years plus of cleanup. Uh, 51, almost two years ago in October, the Rouge River caught on fire. And that was um, just downriver of the I-75. Um, and so that was at a time when not only the Rouge, but the Cuyahoga, and other rivers in the Rust Belt um, were catching on fire because of uh, uncontrolled pollution discharges into the river. Um, since that time, there's been a lot of legislation at the federal, state, and local level that has required um, cities and communities to start cleaning up their act for pollution like that. Um, so the rivers have actually gotten significantly better, including the Rouge. Um, you know, nowadays you can um, catch over 60, 70 species of fish in the river, whereas 50 plus years ago you could catch maybe two. Um, fish are coming back um, tenfold. You see um, all different kinds of birds and um, other various types of wildlife that have come back. Um, we are not delisted as an area of concern at this point, but the river has improved to a point where we can actually offer and encourage paddling sports, so um, partial body contact sports like kayaking and canoeing. And like you mentioned earlier, um, those recreational sports have skyrocketed in um, in this whole region. People like kayaks are being sold out. Um, people are going paddling in the in the dead of winter. We've we've um, done a couple little stories on people out there in their canoes just paddling through the um, through the ice basically <laughs> um, and people are going you know snowshoeing and cross-country skiing and bird watching there's a ton of activities out there on um, the internet that you can get involved with in engaging with the, the natural world and then just getting outside people are outside in droves so um, nature is open and so people are taking advantage of that and, and with them when you're talking about uh, the improvements, what did it take to get to this point? Oh my gosh, it took billions of dollars, a dedicated, you know, multi-community efforts, people at the state level, federal level, local level, nonprofit organizations, municipalities. Um, it, it's a whole um, sort of web of collaborative minds coming together and saying, we need to do something about this river and many of the other rivers. And um, Dr. Don Hardig, who's a, a friend of mine, has written a number of books that he calls the Rouge River revitalization as one of the most um, astounding and important ecological recovery stories in the country. And so, you know, the stories that you heard about the Rouge River when you were younger, uh, I mean, my father grew up on the river and he used to throw like flames uh, at the river, like a, a match at the river and watch it, you know, um, catch on fire a little bit with on the oil slicks. The river is a lot cleaner nowadays. We still have some issues, um, but what it took to get here, billions of dollars and lots of dedication. <laughs> and let's hope that some of these corporations that helped make the Rouge what it was and the issues surrounding it uh, have been held accountable as well. But it also took the dedication of so many volunteers <laughs> to get yeah. to this point. It really did. And 35 years ago, we had our first Rouge rescue. It was, a, it was one of the largest cleanups in the country. Um, it was originally funded by the Ford Motor Company. They gave Friends of the Rouge $50,000 to start this first cleanup effort and had um, you know several thousand people volunteering. At that time, we were pulling out tires, 
cars, mattresses, shopping carts, dumpsters, anything and everything, you name it. And now Rouge Rescue has really transitioned to not just pulling out garbage, but um, kind of doing some ecological restoration things as well. Planting gardens, planting native plants, um, doing educational things along the river as well. So, um, you know, you don't find as much garbage as you used to in the river, although you still do. Um, and, uh, and there are some opportunities for corporate partners to um, sort of take responsibility. If you're familiar with the old channel around Zug Island, mm -hmm. that is a private partner, a private public partnership with Honeywell um, that actually took responsibility uh, for a previous corporation that was there and cleaning up all of their pollution. So a lot of the pollution in the river that still exists are um, heavy metals like PCBs and mercury. And that is sort of sitting at the bottom of the river in some of the sediments that you find down there. So the project that they're doing right now with the EPA and Honeywell is a $50 million project where they're basically dredging out the bottom of the river. They're putting some sheet pile along the edges of the banks to stabilize it. And then they're putting in shelves to create habitat for um, native fish like sturgeon and walleye so that you can recreate some um, breeding grounds for the native fish populations. Marie fish. McCormick with us here on the Mega Cast. She's the executive director for Friends of the Rouge. What needs to be done in the next phase? Well, next phase is um, continuing some of those major restoration projects, getting people across the whole Metro Detroit area to take personal responsibility on their own piece of land. And that might mean plant a rain garden, put in some native plants, get involved with your local community, write a letter to your legislator. Um, so it's the small actions that are collective that make a big difference. Um, and then paired with some of the larger projects like addressing some of the combined sewer outfalls, locating and identifying some of the illicit discharges where pipes might be broken somewhere and then leaking out human waste into the river. Those are really important things we need to think about and address so that we can really tackle some of the water quality issues that are still um, existing today. So Marie, with that, so many of us have been enjoying nature right now. Are yeah. you seeing an increase of people wanting to volunteer to preserve Mother Earth, whether it be with the, you know, the Rouge River or other parts of nature, or are they kind of saying, hey, the river's cleaned up now, we're good to go? No, we, we get requests for volunteers, um, whether it's at the corporate level, individual level, schools, community groups, et cetera, every single day. Um, you know, we are limited in our capacity right now because of our COVID protocol. We limit groups to 25, whereas in previous years, we might have as many as 400, 500 people at a site. So we have to be a lot more um, thoughtful and intentional when we're bringing folks out into spaces where we're encouraging cleanups, but we do have opportunities to get people to do things on their own. So on our website, you can go on and check out, well, what can I do in my own backyard? Maybe I don't wanna plant a garden. Maybe I wanna go clean up garbage. Maybe I want to pull some invasive species. These are things that you can do yourself um, to take action and help preserve this amazing resource that we have um, out our back out our back door. So, with that, uh, can they go to your website? What will they learn if they want to do something on their own? If anything, just for parents to also teach their kids about this important resource during this time. <laughs> So yes, you can go to our website. It's www.therouge.org. And on our website, you can find all of our upcoming events. Um, examples that are coming up in March are Green Your Neighborhood Community Forum. Um, that's a great opportunity um, throughout the whole month of March to engage um, in a sort of a virtual way uh, to make your home and neighborhood more sustainable and with nature-based solutions. We have a frog and toad survey that you can participate in. We usually bring in families from across the whole region. Last year was a, uh, it was the most popular year for our frog and toad surveys. So if you are a family 
you can go out at dusk and you listen for the presence or absence of frogs and toads. And that tells you a story about the health of the river or the, or the sort of the natural area that you're in. And that is a awesome way to, you know, bring your kids out in nature, do something as a family and be socially distanced and COVID friendly. Okay, Marie, let's uh, settle this debate right here and right now. If I touch a toad and it pees on me, am I going to get a wart? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it'll be just fine. <laughs> right? We always heard that as kids. <laughs> I, I know I was... wasn't alone, right? No, I don't I, remember no, I if it was that. a frog or a toad, but I'm pretty sure it was a toad. If you touched it you were and it peed on you, you were going to get a, a wart. I've heard that one. I don't know about the validity of that, but that is certainly <laughs> something I heard as well. Um, since working for Friends of the Rouge, I have uh, lost all my fear of toad urine. So. <laughs> that's good, at least. <laughs> well, that's good. I, I will say, I think uh, my former coworker, Charlie LaDuff, did an amazing story. It's been several years back where he canoed the Rouge. Uh, right. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, they did such a great job and it was very eye-opening and mm -hmm. also you know um, it tells the story I think they did a great job of telling the story of the Rouge you can still find that online if you just google Charlie Ladoff Rouge River uh, canoe uh, it was like you know three parts four parts five seven minute pieces which in the news world yeah, is a lifetime but uh, I think it really helped reach the public and, and tell the history, but also the efforts of the cleanup as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, these stories I'm very are important. Yeah, the stories are important. And it's also important to get to the river, to engage with the river, because if you want to protect something, you have to have a relationship with it and love it. And it, without that relationship, um, which we call stewardship, um, people are going to be less inclined to want to protect the river. So that's part of what we do. We get people interested in and begin to love the Rouge River. That so. is so awesome. And I will say my biggest pet peeve when it comes to, uh, you know, our city of Detroit and that surrounding area is the illegal dumping that goes on. And uh, they don't just do it on vacant lots. They also do it in the river. And um, like I said, it's one of my pet peeves because you're not just harming the uh, environment you're in you know you're harming your community as well and we're seeing the huge efforts that it's taking to get this river cleaned up and it's for the health of all of us so before we let you go marie i do want to ask you you're also a nonprofit. how is funding right now during the middle of a pandemic well thanks for asking um last year we did um fairly well considering um we did have a, a paycheck protection program loan that was granted and we had a number of fairly large grants that came through. So we as a nonprofit are quite fortunate. Um, we have 10 full-time staff and we're hoping to continue growing. Um, but you know, we also know that many nonprofits across the region have suffered immensely during the during the non during the COVID crisis. And so um, you know, I think part of the reason we did well is because of the fact that we're um, associated with an with sort of nature and nature is open and that is a resource that many people can turn to during this time um but also we're just you know very grateful for the community that we um operate in the 48 communities that we serve and uh, the communities just really come to to meet us where we're at and really help us out in this time so thank you so much to our membership our volunteers our corporate partners our foundation partners we are just so grateful for your support and uh, you really made us float and, um, you know, we appreciate that. So thanks for asking. You know what's so great is in the middle of a crisis, uh, you do learn like who really supports you. And when you ask for help, they are there. So that's the beautiful but, thing because it really is but, bringing us together. Yeah. <laughs> With that, Marie, I, before we let you go, anything maybe I didn't touch on that you want to share before we say goodbye? Uh, no, just we're just grateful for the opportunity to talk about Friends of the Rouge and please uh, visit our website. That is our current COVID um, storefront. Um, our offices are currently closed, but you can check out what we're doing on our social channels, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
and we always have something for you to do. So uh, feel free to reach out and uh, remember that nature is open. That is a great tagline. Uh, the rouge.org is your website. Uh, some fun things to do as well, like maybe your neighborhood once we get to springtime, right? We are going to be getting there. <laughs> That's right. Yes, fingers crossed. It rained a little last night, and so I was excited to see some of the snow melt. Um, I'm looking forward to spring and planting some more some more gardens. So I can't wait for some sunshine and getting my nails dirty again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been great having you, and thank you for your dedication as well to our environment and uh, to the rivers. So with that, uh, we're going to wrap up the interview, and then still a lot to get to in the second hour of the Megacast. When we come back, we will be speaking to the president of the Alliance of Coalitions. This is the Oakland County Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local shop local and especially shopping local let's beat this virus we can if we face it together 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 for the latest information visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID Michigan the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test and now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. back with us here on the Megacast. As a reminder, you're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. You can always catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. You can also tune us in Channel 15 on Comcast 99 if you have AT&T. As we kick off the second hour of the Monday edition of the Megacast, over 2,000 teens begin abusing prescription drugs each and every day. Overdoses are on the rise, but a small kit can help save lives. With us now, Julie Brenner. She's the president of the Alliance of Coalitions for Healthy Communities. Great to have you with us again, Julie. How are you doing? Thank you. I am doing well. How are you? And I appreciate the opportunity again. Oh, sure. And happy 2021. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> many of you that are hoping that uh, this year things start to slow down a bit. But do you think that's going to happen? Um, I don't think so. I think we are. Um, this is our new normal for a while. And I don't know when the end is, but we're here to help in any way we can. Gosh, so that has to be um, such a sad thought to think how many people are dying during this time because of the pandemic. But also, I mean, this was an issue before the pandemic when we were talking a lot about the overdose crisis. And then it seemed to take a back street or a back seat rather uh, to some of the issues going on. But do you think now we're starting to get the focus back on this uh, problem here in our communities? I don't know if we're getting the focus back on it. Um, obviously with uh, vaccinations going out for COVID, that is definitely a priority. Um, with what we do, our focus is always on trying to reverse overdose death rates 
and increasing prevention efforts. So uh, we're here doing it no matter what, with or without COVID. And uh, we have found now that because of social distancing, that the need to be able to administer it, or I'm sorry, to provide the training has, has switched for us. So uh, drive-through trainings is, uh, drive-through drive-up trainings is what we're, we're doing now to, to get to the people that we serve. Wow. Hey, before we jump into that conversation, uh, give us a little bit of background on uh, the Alliance of Coalitions and your mission and the work that you are doing. Sure. So the Alliance of Coalitions for Healthy Communities is an Oakland County based organization since 2003. Our main focus for many years was providing a strong collaboration and prevention dollars for what is now 21 prevention coalitions that again blanket Oakland County with strong prevention interventions. About seven years ago, we added in recovery support and wellness initiatives so that we could uh, assist the per a person with their whole body, with their whole uh, mental health because addiction, uh, drug use, things like that aren't just one-offs. They're usually part of some sort of co-occurring uh, issue that's happening with that person. So we became a bit more well-rounded and focused now um, with our mission on prevention, recovery support, and wellness initiatives for everyone in Oakland County and across Southeast Michigan. But we do know that lives are being saved if people just have the small kit with them yes. in their house or in their car. Tell us about it. Oh, great. Yeah, so we've been distributing it for two years um, with what we had was face-to-face -face, uh, training. Save a life is what we call it. So uh, save a life, um, it's basically harm reduction. And um, it was an hour-long training where you would go to a, a local area and get that training. The kit itself has two doses of nasal Narcan. Uh, we also have a first aid information, CPR, um, the, the uh, masks we've just to protect yourself if you're having to do that, um, and gloves, because your, sa your safety if you come upon someone who is in the throes of an overdose are essential. The other component of that is number one, is, is call 911. You need to be able to have um, emergency responders um, coming your way as quickly as possible so that they can take it from there. So with that, uh, I will say, um, I don't know, my kit is similar to the one that you guys have been giving out, but I went through the training a few years ago when I actually worked with the uh, ATF and we got mm -hmm. a couple of kits. So I keep one in my car and then one in my house. Uh, but I will say, um, it's like you said, you have the gloves, you have, um, this is a part of it. I will say, I forget. I think it's so, a mask that looks okay, like this, the mask. This is the mask yeah. and then this is the spray. That's the spray, yep. So, um, but it does expire as well. Mine expired uh, 2019, so if- it does, it does have a shelf life of up to two years. Um, so, but we do encourage you to definitely get refills. Obviously, um, you're connected to us. So I'm happy to provide you some refills, um, but there is a bit of a shelf life on that. So if um, we really do try to make sure that um, once you've used it, that you get back in touch with us. Um, we do have a refill refill capability for anyone that's used it, um, and then we'll make sure that it gets back in your hands again. Because explain to us again how this works and how it can save someone's life. Sure, so it's almost automatic. Um, if somebody's in the throes, basically it's respiratory failure is what we're talking about um, when, you're, when you're dealing with an overdose. So the nasal Narcan um, is inserted um, after CPR and everything else that you're trying to do, um, is inserted into your nostrils and it's almost instantaneous. Um, and it is short lived. So let's say it's a 15, 15 minute, 30 minute window, maybe a little bit more. And that's why it's really essential to make sure that you're calling 911 to get the first responders there so that they can take it from there. Um, it is not, a, it is not a, a cure. It is a temporary um, fix to make sure that your air passageways are open so that you're breathing again. Again, we're really talking about respiratory failure. So that's really obviously uh, essential to living. So 911, get them there and um, then they'll take it from there. They usually end up at the hospital. Julie Brenner with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the president for the Alliance of Coalitions. And with that, Julie, who should get one of these kits? We believe everybody. 
So if you are, to start out with, this is how it started. For anybody, a family member, um, anyone related to parent, grandparent, caregiver um, that has someone that is um, either in recovery or um, has used, I mean, that's, that sort of was top of mind for us when we started this. However, since then, we do believe that this should be a part of everybody's first aid kit. I, like you, I have the same thing. One in my home, one in my car. You do not know when it could happen and it can happen anywhere to anyone. Um, we also believe businesses, um, we think it's very essential that all businesses um, um, have it at their front desk, have it in their first aid kit, have it a part of their, uh, their safety protocols. Um, it is that important. So uh, one of the reasons I keep mine in my car was also for the fact that I volunteer on the streets of Detroit with the homeless. But if you come across people, how do you know when it's time to use this and when it's not? Because it's different if it's a family member and you know their history versus coming right. across maybe a stranger. So you're looking for some like some of the things, obviously erratic behavior. You might walk into a, let's say uh, you're at a, um, uh, a restaurant or something, you walk into the bathroom and someone has passed it on the floor, you know, you're looking for their pupils to be dilated, that their breathing is labored, things like that. Um, I have an example, real life example. Um, this actually happened to me driving, coming out of a, going out for lunch with a colleague and this truck was driving erratically on a, a quite a busy road. And what ended up happening is he pulled in to, just happened to pull in, thank God, pulled in and, um, upon approach 911 on the phone following protocols you know remembering trying to do everything that you can and um he had a he did end up having uh, was in the throes of an overdose at, as a result of heroin and um 911 was called out and and they guided me through it but um in that moment and that was like three or four years ago i did not have narcan on me and oh my gosh had i had it um, but uh, that's exactly what they did. They um, you just used an injectable Narcan and he came out of it right away and off he went to uh, the hospital. So uh, it could happen anywhere, anytime. And so I think it's really important to recognize if there's paraphernalia around, not to touch anything. Um, you know, first aid, CPR, if you know it, that those are really the things that we're teaching you, keeping them on their left side, making sure that their airways are clear and uh, performing CPR if that is something that you're trained in and you know how to do. In our trainings, we do go through all of that to make sure that you are equipped in that scenario. So um, really I'm, like looking at the lay of the land, seeing that this person you know, may have paraphernalia, there may not, you know, it's just an automatic 911 and then start following the process. Yeah, I think about this and um, a lot of fast food restaurants are experiencing this where people are going in and using their bathrooms. Yes. Um, and so it really should be something like you said, that's part of every business and every person's first aid kit. Um, but how often should you get the training? Uh, we're suggesting once a year, um, especially with Narcan being um, it has in, having an expiration date um, once a year. And if you're not comfortable and you want to do it more often, for obvious reasons, we will do it as many times until you feel comfortable. <clears throat> to be honest, I don't think anybody's very comfortable with having to do something like that. It's a high pressure, high tense situation. It's an emergency. So uh, we recommend once a year. Um, and if you're working within a business and there's a high turnover rate with your staff, uh, obviously multiple times a year to make sure that everybody is up to speed on, um, on those things. Um, we do provide um, information, more information on our website. When we do get your information, when you do uh, complete a training, um, we do push out any extra information if there's anything new, if there's anything um, regarding the actual medication and uh, refills and things like that. So. We do keep track of that to make sure that we're we're giving our people the best and most recent uh, dose dosage and information. Julie Brenner with us here on the Mega Cast. She's with the Alliance of Coalitions. Julie, what if I'm out though and I have a kit? I notice my kit maybe is expired because we don't think about this if we don't really use it or if we don't have a loved one that could be at risk. But let's say mm -hmm. you go through the training, you keep one in your car. Um, are there any like liability issues that an individual could come into from attempting to help someone? No, um, everyone's covered by the Good Samaritan law. 
And so, no, no, you're not. You would have no liability at all. The reality is, and it's this, the name of our program, Save a Life. That's what it's for. That's why it's super important to call 911. Um, you know, we do have scenarios where um, there's there's overdose deaths and uh, or overdose potential overdoses within um, homes and things like that. And um, we're not always call or we're not always called for refills or anything like that. But 911 sometimes isn't called, and I need it to be really clear. This is a short term solution. 911 needs to be called. 15 minute, maybe 40 minutes, um, and you know it depends on the human and how they metabolize it. Um, it is not a forever fix. It's a quick fix to get you out of respiratory failure and get you into the hands of medical people. Um, so, you know, if you're giving multiple doses to somebody um, and you're not calling 911, I mean, that can be fatal. Very well, dangerous. Because how does it actually work? What's it doing to the body to make it work? So it's, it's reversing the, the attack of the opioid. Um, it's literally shutting it off um, in your system. Um, which sometimes is not well received by the person who was indulging in that substance, unfortunately. Um, so with that, it, it sort of it attacks the antagonist and, and it, it opens up the airways again so that you can breathe and get oxygen, which again is an essential piece of, of a human. Well, and we know people who are drowning oftentimes will fight back, too, from the person that's trying to save them. So kind yeah. of the same type of response, right? They're yes. coming back and they're they're fighting back, but you need to work through it to to help them survive the incident. Absolutely. And again, and I cannot emphasize this enough. You need to call your first responders. 911 is the first thing you do as fast as you can or you know somebody in the room that's there with you it's really important to get them there um, so that they can get you to uh, to the best care so uh, you're doing the drive-through service now are you also doing any type of virtual training for people I love that you asked that so when the epidemic hit or the pandemic hit um, we quickly switched our our face-to-face um, -face trainings to online so we have probably two to four a week right now um, online and you can get that off of our website. Um, I think it's really important to note that um, with that extension and, and ability to access this training online, we've reached far greater than Michigan. So there's a lot of uh, individuals out there that are looking for this kind of help. And um, with that being said as well, um, the drive-through, um, especially now with um, you know COVID testing and things like that, um, it is, uh, again, meeting people where they're at, making sure that they get the, the information that they need. But I will say that um, being able to do it virtually has really opened up our ability to reach more people by far. And from that standpoint, too, it, that would probably be a pretty good refresher course for people such as myself that have been through it. 100%. All, it's free. It's 100% free. So, it, it, you know, get online and if you need to refresh your course, go back online. You fill out an, uh, some information and do a survey um, and then within days you will receive a package from us uh, with your dose, with your Save a Life package, including all the things we talked about earlier and your Narcan. And also there is a link if you need a refill and you have been through our training. Um, our team goes back through to make sure that you know you've been trained appropriately, and then you are given another refill. So it, there is really no reason for anyone to have um, expired, unless honestly, yeah, it sits in your car and you don't really notice it and you have never used it. But um, thank God you have it, just in case. I mean, what would what would that world look like if you did come upon someone that was overdosing and you didn't have it? Uh, so with that, how can people find out more about uh, some of these? events going on, the drive-through, the drive-up services, uh, so sure. they can try to take uh, part in it if they need to. Right, so our website, on our website, which is uh, achcmi.org, we have uh, a tab called online trainings, and that is uh, where you would see where all of our Save a Life uh, trainings are. Within our drive-through, our, our calendar and events, everyone is listed it's just a click on on the date and and there's the information so we do have them coming up every friday through the end of march uh and uh, i mean outside of going on our our website you can also get us on all of our social media sites so we're on facebook instagram twitter linkedin uh, we have a youtube channel things like that so if you just search for the alliance of coalitions 
and or the Alliance of Coalitions for Healthy Communities, our longer name, uh, then you should be able to find um, anything like that. We do do, um, all of our events are posted as well on Facebook, and then we do post them in our local community, chambers of commerce, and the newspapers. Well, we know that uh, you do so many other great things as well. And, and Julie, I know the numbers are still being compiled regarding yes. the impact of COVID-19 um, in the world that you are working in right now. But while we don't have any official numbers and we probably won't for quite some time, uh, what are you seeing on the front lines? On the front lines, we're seeing an uptick in, uh, in substance misuse um, and the much, much of it has to do with anxiety and isolation. Um, COVID has created a different type of uh, world for us that I think has really increased mental health issues. And sometimes that turns into substance misuse. So we are seeing an uptick. And I know nationally, we, there's a, a 81,000 drug overdose deaths occurred um, in the 12 months ending May, 2020. So the first little blip of, of COVID, not a blip of COVID, I'm not being uh, disrespectful, like COVID is here. There's not a blip, but that's the highest number of overdose deaths that were ever recorded in a 12 month period. That's alarming. And that's just that portion, that first quarter of COVID. So now we're into, and we'll, you know, I, I hope to be back um, someday soon when I've got more up to date dates on what's actually happening here in Oakland County. But we are seeing a really strong uptick in people reaching out for recovery support, uh, family members reaching out for recovery support, trying to understand what's happening. And um, I think part of this is this isolation and mental health uh, is something that we need to really spend and invest some more time in when it comes to substance misuse, um, you know, people reaching out for treatment, uh, tr people reaching out period uh, for connection is really important. Yeah, but the great thing is um, it's sad that you are seeing an increase. However, it is a good thing as well because that means more people are saying that they are having issues and they are seeking help, which is Absolutely. why you there you are there and your team as well. So um, again, great work that you guys are doing and we appreciate you. everything you're doing for our community as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Julie Brenner with us here on the Megacast. She's the president for the Alliance of Coalition. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Megacast and when we come back, we'll be speaking with the Detroit Historical Society. This is the Megacast. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet Wear facial coverings when you leave your home and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios with Mr. Tyler Keith. Great to be back on this Monday because last week, very hectic, Tyler. Yeah, very hectic week, a very busy week for us here at, at Civic Center TV last week, but a productive week too. We got a lot of important information out to the viewers of 
this channel and the other outlets as well about COVID-19. And uh, all of that is now on our website, civiccentertv.com. We have, uh, of course, the COVID-19 vaccine town hall that we did last week. That is on our homepage, as well as some of the most important clips. And all of that is, and more clips even are on demand on civiccentertv.com. Just click on the Megacast link and you will find all of that as you do each and every day with our programming here on the show. Yeah, I go back and uh, catch a lot of the interviews through the on-demand section or send them to people as well. I have a lot of people who reach out to me and I'm like, oh, here's how you can uh, find out more information about this individual or another. Tyler, I have to say, um, I was trying to find my bag because I was like, I probably need more lipstick because it looks like most uh -oh. of my lipstick is on my cup. It is pretty red. Yeah, the, the lid of the cup is pretty red. But, <laughs> it's a um, female problem. This is one thing guys never have to worry about. And also, like, wearing a mask. My friends were making fun of me because I was like, I am reapplying my lipstick so much. And they're like, you wear lipstick underneath your mask? I'm like, but you take it down. You take it up. Right. You take it down. You take it up. Yeah, you're just painting the inside of the mask, basically, at that point. Right? Chick problems, one-on-one. Yeah. <laughs> What are you going to do? <laughs> so with that, I'm, I'm telling you, every lady out there is going to uh, actually be able to recognize and understand what I'm talking about. Uh, hey, since 1921, the Detroit Historical Society has been capturing and documenting stories to preserve our history, stories that help us better understand the events and the people that influence the world around us. And of course, the pandemic has not stopped their very, very important work. With us here on the Megacast is Rebecca Salmonen witt She is the Chief Development and Communications Officer for the Detroit Historical Society. Great to have you with us again. Thank you so much for having me. I was excited to come back. Rebecca, can you agree with me about the lipstick and the mask thing? Completely. I actually, this weekend was washing the inside of masks. <laughs> right. <laughs> See, I'm not alone in going through the uh, problems that we go through as women uh, during this pandemic. Maybe that's something that you can document there at the uh, Detroit Historical Society. Well, you know what? We've got an oral history project that's specifically about people's experiences during the uh, pandemic. And I'm waiting, maybe Ronnie, maybe you can call in and your oral history can be about the trials and tribulations of applying and continuously applying lipstick be behind a mask. Well, I wondered from a business standpoint, how much their sales in the cosmetic industry has it gone up or gone down because of the way we're living and we're working right now and a lot of people are saying well i'm hardly wearing makeup right now you know except for those zoom calls so uh, I mean, eye makeup skyrocketing lipstick not so much right exactly but with that it really it's it's a sad time for our country rebecca but it's also from a historical standpoint has to be somewhat fascinating as well. Well, you know what, when, when this whole thing started, we, we said, you know, literally, your historical society was made for this time. Because one of the things that we do that people don't often think about is document history as it's happening. And we document history as it's happening so that people 50 years, 100 years from now who are going through the next pandemic have something to base their actions on. You know, some of the some of the stuff that we've done now has been based upon the pandemic that happened in 1918, 100 years ago. Right. So um, it really is important work. work and, and though I, you know, kind of talked about what your potential oral history could be in jest, um, everybody's stories from this time are really important, and that's why we're collecting them. And one thing we have that they didn't have 100 years ago are technology, because I wonder how the stories would be different if they had our technology today from 100 years ago, because now we're all trying to find out as much as we can about yeah. the pandemic during that time and how they were living, and there's not really a lot of information out there. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly it's much more possible to um, for us to gather stories from every corner of our community. It's a lot easier to provide your story. Back in 1918, you know, it was the, the hard work of collecting stories one by one and writing them down as people were telling you. And, and now you can literally 
type up your story and email it to us. You can call us on the phone and leave a voicemail. You know, I mean, it's so much easier now that the volume of material that we're able to collect to your point is, is a lot greater. So we should have a really good record of this time, uh, you know, for God forbid this situation you know, ever happen again, but for the next folks who have to face something similar. Right, and history is so important to help guide us through some of these times that we are experiencing. But uh, the one thing about the written word, it has survived, but we have so many different platforms of technology. So when you're documenting history today, you know, whether it deals with the pandemic or something else, are you worried about the various platforms that are available and that maybe they're not going to be in use 50 years or 100 years from now? Because I don't know about you, but I don't have an eight track uh, tape deck in the in my basement. I do have eight track tapes because of my husband, he's a hoarder, uh -oh. but I do not have the deck to play them on. So does that play into your thought process? It does. And, and incidentally, we've got the deck to play them on at <laughs> historical society because we put together all that you know sort of now ancient technology so that we can continue to use those things and um you know it's it's wonderful to have such a great staff of professional curators at the society because they're the tricky folks who understand what will and will not survive you know to the best of our knowledge now how to preserve things like zoom conversations um so that we we can all remember in 20 years like oh yeah that was that weird thing we used to do during the pandemic right Right? Um, but we'll be able to, to preserve those with the appropriate technology um, so that they're, they'll be available for future, for future generations. You have you know, such a fascinating job there and being able to be a part of so many uh, stories. But where do things stand in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis? We're 11 months in, but are you open for visitors? How is that working right now? Well, thank you for asking because we are open. In fact, we've been open since July 10th, and um, we, you know, we operate two museums. So the Dawson Great Lakes Museum on Belle Isle and um, the Detroit Historical Museum right downtown in um, in Detroit on Woodward in Midtown. Um, both museums are open. We do have limited time, so they're open Thursday through Sunday. Um, you know, 10 a.m. to 5 on Thursday through Saturday, 1 to 5 on Sunday. Um, but both both museums have new exhibits right now. We just opened a new exhibit at the Dawson called The the Last Ice. It's about ice fishing on the Great Lakes. It's fascinating. It's been really popular just in its opening weekend. New exhibit at the main museum as well um, called Boomtown. And that's actually celebrating our centennial. So we're turning 100 years old this year. We're, we're becoming a historical artifact ourselves. Um, Boomtown celebrates actually that whole decade of the 20s. It's a fascinating exhibit and people are loving it. So not only are we open, we are continuing to put new exhibits up. Um, we've got all the COVID safety protocols that folks need and want to feel safe. So we do timed ticketing. Those tickets are available online. It makes sure that neither of our museums are overrun at any given time. You've got lots of space to feel safe in. Um, all the sanitizing, we've got the arrows on the floor, all of those things people have come to expect and um, need to feel safe, those are in place at, at, at your museum. So we encourage everybody to come down. It's a great thing to do on a day when it's gray like today and there's a bunch of snow outside. Oh my gosh, uh, right now is a great time to be indoors. Hey, uh, Rebecca, before I get to the ice fishing exhibit, because I do want to talk about that, ice fishing, of course, here in our local area has been a huge thing. Uh, but let's talk about Boomtown because someone else pointed out to me, uh, Tyler, uh, not long ago, hey, coming out of the last pandemic, the roaring 20s. So what do you think is going to happen for us coming out of the pandemic right now? Are we going into a new version of the Roaring Twenties? Because I will tell you, I've already warned everyone. If I see you, you're getting a hug. That's, that's right. Well, you know, I think there were a lot of parts about the Twenties that were really great, and I'm all for bringing those back in, the, in our next iteration after we get this pandemic ha handled. Um, you know, it's it's 
people are talking about you know we are we are poised to come sort of our economy our society come back open up in a way that is very open and you know um sort of rejoicing in our ability to be together and i think that would be a great outcome and a great you know very similar to the roaring 20s so um we're hoping <laughs> I'm ready for it. I don't know about you, yeah. but uh, watch out. The parties are coming. Uh, but with that, let's talk a little bit about your um, ice fishing and the exhibit there, because uh, here we had Cass Lake and Sylvan Lake. They had their big um, ice fest uh, this weekend, which I will say, I don't know how I've lived in Kegel Harbor as long as I have and didn't know about the Cass Lake pop-up ice fest. It was huge. Um, this is really a big part of our community. It really is. You know, we had this opportunity to collaborate with photographer Amy Saka, um, uh, uh, installation artist Scott Hawking, um, another photographer, uh, Valorian Morris, and another um, artist as well to put this on. Amy kind of was the engine behind it. She started ice fishing with her father a few years ago, uh, maybe a decade or so ago, really as a way to, to spend time with him. And she, uh, as a photographer, of course, documented their time together and noticed over the course of several years that whereas they used to start their ice fishing adventures every winter in December or so, it was getting later and later every year. She started going around the whole Great Lakes region to document ice fishing everywhere in the Great Lakes and, and really ended up kind of traveling around looking for places where they had ice. And so she named the exhibition Last Ice and it's really kind of about that intersection be, behind um, this, this activity that really is important to people on the Great Lakes. You know, it's really a part of our culture. I've ice fished for years and, you know, most people I know have at least taken one trek out there to peer down the hole and, you know, look for the fish. And um, and so that intersection with the intersection of climate change and what's going on here that we, you know, we can't go out ice fishing in December anymore because there's open water still at that time. And so um, the exhibition itself is beautiful. Amy's um, f photography and Valorian's photography is gorgeous. It's both inside and outside the museum. So for your viewers, um, at the Dawson Great Lakes Museum last year, we completed this project of uh, sort of renovating all of the outside spaces at our museum. So the, for the very first time, the grounds, which are this gorgeous riverfront site, are also available as a museum goer. And so this is kind of our first exhibit to really take advantage of that and use those outdoor spaces as well as indoor spaces uh, for a gallery for the photography too. That is so awesome. Uh, tell us about the other uh, new exhibit, Boomtown. Boomtown. So Boomtown is um, in our lower level at the Detroit uh, Historical Museum, everybody's favorite streets of old Detroit. It's really kind of a part of that. It focuses on the story of 20 unique Detroiters from the 20s sort of that whole decade, follows their unique trips around. And it's kind of the, the stories of the people, some who you may have heard of and some who you never would have heard of, um, who made Detroit what it was at that time, which was a really formative time for our city. It's kind of when our city became the city that we know and love today, um, both from it from an architecture standpoint, but also sort of from its societal standpoint, what it meant to people. And so those we've got everything from you know a 15 year old girl who was a rum runner in during prohibition um dr ocean sweet is in that exhibit um we've got a um a, a, a an early 20s suffragette is in that um display so there's you know there's everything from from you know folks from high society to folks who were just sort of doing the work to make sure that detroit could become what it what it eventually did that we're proud to be a part of right now Rebecca Salmonen went with us here on the Megacast. She's the Chief Development and Communications Officer for the Detroit Historical Society. By far, someone with one of the coolest jobs within the city of Detroit. Uh, you guys are doing a new podcast now? We are, yeah. So we just started. Um, podcasts are a lot harder than we thought they might be. 
Um, the Historical Society has a ton of content. And so we're just always looking for new ways to get that content out to people because it's so fascinating. Um, this fall, we opened another new exhibit. It's called Detroit's Brewing Heritage. And it's about kind of the history of beer in Detroit. Also in the lower level, super fun. Don't miss it when you come to the society. The podcast is called Detroit Untold. So that's the name of the podcast. This chapter, if you will, is about beer. And so we interview all the folks, both people um, who had a historical role in, in brewing beer in the city and people who are brewing beer in the city now. And it's, um, it's a great, it's a really fun kind of ride. Um, we just launched it and uh, we're super excited to see how people um, think of it. So is it available on Apple or which platform? Yep, all of your, all of your main platforms. So you can find it everywhere, Apple, Spotify. Yeah, great. I, it's like you said, though, podcasts are so much harder than people think. Uh, I'm starting up a new one with a former co-worker. We were both reporters and we're going to be covering um, some of the old stories that we uh, covered. Um, and it's so much harder than people think. <laughs> it's like a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah, it's been in development for a year. You know, so we wrote it, we rewrote it, we interviewed everybody, we wrote it again. Someone <laughs> stole our original name, we had to rename it a couple of times. So we had like all, over and over again. It was it was all these things that we never would have thought of. But um, like I said, we've got really engaging people at the Historical Society and really great content. So I, I think people are gonna love it. And we've got lots of additional season ideas already stacked up. So oh my God. hopefully people will love it. We'll get a lot of new visitors out of it and we will make a new season coming up soon. So much content. That's going to be the tricky point, is like really trying to navigate through all that content because sometimes too much content yeah. is just as hard as not having enough. Hey, uh, quickly before we let you go, I know we're running a, a little late here though. Uh, let's talk about your upcoming event, Bourbon and Bowtie. Bourbon. First, you got beer on the podcast. Now you have uh -huh. bourbon and bow ties. I love the Detroit <laughs> Historical to, Society. A sense of theme here. <laughs> It's a pandemic. We, um, we started Bourbon and Bowties a couple of years ago, and um, it's been really a, a fun event. Um, it's also an event that helps introduce the S Historical Society and our museums to new audiences, which is important to us. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of why we keep bringing it back, because it does have a whole new audience of people who get to see a, a museum a lot of times for the first time since they were like in third grade and they came on a on a school tour or something this one is at the a main museum so the Detroit historical museum in midtown um, it is going to be on saturday the 27th of march and it's basically arranged as a tour and and it's a kind of a tour from kentucky to detroit and back again so you get to sample um, bourbons from all of those places there are two act stations where they're actually mixing drinks with it so it's not merely a tasting but also a drink mixing um kind of you know uh instructional piece um ticket Purchasers get um, their own sort of individual delicious boxed um, box of snacks and desserts. Um, and it's just going to be a fun day. So there's a couple of different options. I think one starts at one and one starts at three. Tickets are still available, um, although they are going fast. So um, apparently there's a pent up demand for bourbon in Detroit. Who would have <laughs> right. And why. in person as well. Right. Yeah. Yes, in person. So um, that's another, you know, kind of fun piece about it. We do have a virtual um, drinking uh, edition as well that does historic drinks. That's called Museum Mixology, and that'll be coming back this summer for another run as well. Well, that's great. Rebecca, always fun having you. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I always love to see you guys. Great. Hey, quickly before we say goodbye, give us your website again, because I would imagine that's also the place for people to get the information about everything we've talked about here today. That's exactly right. All the exhibits are on there. Our open and closing hours are on there and tickets for everything we do are on there as well. It is, it's easy to remember. It's just DetroitHistorical.org. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Always great having you. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we are going to be speaking with a local furniture maker here in the metro Detroit area. This is the Oakland County Megacast. We don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? 
Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 mask. The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Just about 15 minutes left here on the Monday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. I will say, Tyler, this uh, two hours, it flies by each and every day. Yeah, it does. It goes by really quickly. And, uh, you know, we have really interesting guests like we've had today that have a lot to talk about. And it's interesting to go back and forth with them. The the two-hour time window really flies by quick. So as uh, we all know, uh, we're in the middle of the pandemic right now. We're spending way Way too much time Way too much. at home. Oh, yes. So that has all of us nesting, per se. That includes me. And that's uh, sparked the home renovation explosion. I know that right now I'm bugging my husband for a new couch, new countertops, yeah. a new backsplash, and so many other things. Uh, with that, though, uh, excited to speak with our next guest. First time on the show. Kyle, is it Huntoon? Huntoon. He's a designer and craftsman for the Hunt and Neuer Furniture Company. Great to have you with us. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to, great to hang out via Zoom. Hey, I will say, though, Kyle, I'm so bummed. I never got the chance to watch the show, uh, the Ellen show on HGTV because I love HGTV and I love Ellen. Well, it was, it was, it was a little while ago. It was in the beginning of 2016. I was on the second season of Ellen's Design Challenge, uh, which is a furniture design competition show that HGTV held. Um, I was competing against 11 other people for $100,000 in cash, classic reality TV show prize. Um, I did not win, but I did get um, fourth place out of everyone. Um, And I was really proud because I was the only person there that didn't go to art school. I actually went to University of Michigan for civil engineering becoming before becoming a furniture maker. Um, but it was definitely weird to um, see commercials of myself on HGTV on like <laughs> Sunday nights, like, and just, just I mean, I, it was kind of like, it was like I was embarrassed in a way, even though I was excited. Um, and then, you know, every Monday night um, for about two months, I was on the show. So I was on seven of nine episodes. Um, of the show and it was a really interesting experience um that is like sharing something totally unique with 11 other people that i i can't i can explain it but it's like i it would take me like days well i will say even though you don't win the final competition you still won just by being picked as one of the individuals to be on the show but i am kind of thinking about some of your old college friends were they like dude look at you on hgtv yeah you know it's funny because um I don't have the cleanest mouth. Um, and, <laughs> and mostly what my friends noticed, they're like, wow, you're saying like, darn it and heck a lot. Um, but like, um, try to keep it clean. My mom asked me to keep it clean while I was there. And um, yeah, it was, it's, it, it was a big shift from, um, you know, going to school for engineering. I spent five years um, as a civil engineer designing uh, the power grid. Um, and I just, wasn't passionate about it you know i i always wanted to get my hands dirty and i wanted to make tangible work and i wanted to produce things that people could enjoy and like engage with people more you know and yeah it was different to have people see me in that light but i i think it was pretty cohesive you know to to who i was and where i was headed and look you can never um say no to uh, you know the opportunity just to get your name out there as well because what did that mean from 
an advertising standpoint about sharing your story and your work with the world? You know, um, it's helped me quite a bit. Um, initially, it didn't have the explosive effect that I was really hoping, but um, as, ter as far as like name recognition goes, you know, um, helps really, really great, you know, for Google searching and all of the whole stuff that goes into how businesses can get exposure these days through like SEO and other things that like are kind of hard to ex complicated subjects. But um, it's helped me with name recognition. It's helped me have other opportunities open up. Like um, for the past few years, I've been selling a few of my pieces through a partnership with West Elm. That's a national retailer. They have a store in Birmingham, um, Michigan here, and then they have about 90 other stores. Um, and it, it opened up that, the, the doors to other things. And it's been like a slow burn, but it's been um, very helpful. Um, other than that, there were a few local situations where I was at like Eastern Market and someone was like, you were on that show. And it was like, <laughs> It was like a nine-year-old and with her parents and, she, and they're like, who is that? And she's like, he's on the design show. And I was like, okay, nice to meet you. Uh, but, with, kind of, uh, but I love your work. Uh, West Elm, uh, one of my favorite uh, stores. I mean, they have such beautiful uh, furniture, uh, but you also have a very unique style. Uh, it's very slim. So how is, is business picking up right now because of the pandemic? Yeah, so I've been very fortunate. Um, a couple things happened where at the beginning of last year, unbeknownst to the situation, um, the pandemic situation, I was build, rebuilding a website. So I rebuilt my website, which um, easily accepts payments. We have, you know, you can select furniture right on there. You can buy a piece that everything is made to, excuse me, everything is made to order by hand but you can buy a piece just outright, or you can contact us for custom orders. Um, the few pieces that I sell through West Elm, it's a partnership called West Elm Local, where they highlight people that hand make goods, whether that's a piece of furniture or like tea towels for your home or prints. Um, there's like kind of a roster of West Elm local makers throughout the country, which I'm fortunate to be one of. They only have a few furniture makers um, and I kind of was an earlier one. Um, so the few pieces I sell through them are a bench, um, which can be an entry bench or a coffee table. It's kind of a versatile piece of furniture. I also sell a console table that is also a desk. So my desk, which is a, a compact desk, uh, is like perfect for work from home. And that's, I've seen my sales of that item specifically just like skyrocket in the last year. Um, We've sold about 80 desks last year, and the year before that, I think we sold maybe 25, 30 through that program. Um, and we ship them all over the country. I mean, I today I, le I left my shop so I could have better internet service and talk to you at home, um, but we're shipping desks to New York, Vermont, New Mexico, Seattle, California, Florida. They go everywhere every time we make a batch of them. Um, so it's been very good for business. I feel very fortunate and it feels a little weird to be um, celebrating the, the positive aspects of the year for my business, but I, I can only take that and like move forward with it, you know, and, and be one of the fortunate few people that has had that experience. But no, from uh, for the rest of us, we need stories like yours because yeah. they're uplifting to all of us and we should let people know if they haven't been to your website, you, the furniture is beautiful. This isn't Ikea put together stuff at home. It's a piece of art. And what I when I see it, it's a piece of art and it's to be shared and passed down generation to generation. How do you come up with your designs? Well, you know, you say passed down and that's, that's our intent. I actually um, became a furniture maker, um, not directly, but indirectly because it's been in my family for uh, four or five generations. Um, my dad is not in woodworking at all, but my great great grandfather, great grandfather, grandfather, they all um, were barn builders, furniture makers, cabinet makers. Um, and I saw a lot of the furniture that they made in my grandparents' home growing up. And it was impressive to just be like, where the heck, how did someone make that? You know, how did someone make that thing? And then I, you know, I just like, I want to figure it out. And I think that's where like my engineering brain 
made its way to furniture making. But as far as my designs go, um, I'm really like keyed into the history of furniture making and what resonated with me is mid-century aesthetics. Um, a lot of the designs came from partnerships that were formed in the Detroit area. So a lot of the, the famous furniture makers of that era, the Eames uh, couple, um, Aero Saarinen, uh, George Nelson, they they met at Cranbrook. They all kind of like, it was like a melting pot of, of makers and designers. And um, a lot of American modernism history comes from the Detroit area. And I think that's really cool. And, you know, having been someone who collected furniture for a while after I got out of college, I started getting into the aesthetic of it. Big time thrift shopper ever since I was in high school. So I was like finding cool pieces of furniture that I was like, these are these appeal to me. Then realizing like, oh, geez, like a lot of people collect these. And then it's like, oh, OK, well, I want to get into woodworking. Like, what's my aesthetic? And it was just kind of a natural transition to gravitate towards that. Now, one of the things that I do that we do with Hunt and Noir, I say we because I have a couple um, people that work with me. We have a small team of people that work together on the furniture making, um, is to highlight joinery and, and traditional aspects of furniture making, bringing them into the modern era of furniture ownership, collection, curation of your home kind of thing. Um, we choose to use exposed joinery. Um, the joint that we use is called a box joint. A lot of people might look at it and say, that's a dovetail joint. Um, and honestly, that's fine with me if people like misidentify it as such, because the point is to show people how things are made and to show people that the furniture is made well, um, it's made out of solid wood, um, and it's built to last. And the design is minimal in the intention that we want to like show clean lines, and you know, show something that's unique. The turned legs that we use, you know, they're laid, they're turned on a wood lathe, um, and that's just my own aesthetic. And it, I think of it as kind of quirky, but I also think that it makes it unique in the sense that we keep that repetition through our work, and you can see Hunt and Neuer furniture and identify it as Hunt and Neuer furniture, and you know that it's unique, well made, handmade, and made of solid American you know, lumber, um, domestically sourced wood. We use walnut for mostly everything. So but, with that, um, Kyle, where do you get your supplies? Because we also know during the pandemic, the supply chain has been broken in some arenas as well. Yeah, um, at the beginning of last year, it was kind of difficult to make sure that we were getting the materials that we needed in all aspects of the job. Um, you know, it doesn't just take the lumber, but it also is like wood finish, sandpaper, um, shipping boxes, like every all sorts of stuff. So keeping every all the everything lubed in the you know the machine of the of the furniture business working was difficult at the beginning. But we source all of our lumber from a couple different sawmills. Um, uh, we use Johnson's Lumber in Charlotte, Michigan, which is near Lansing. Um, they've been in the furniture business for, I think, 130 years, like servicing the state of Michigan and a lot of the furniture production that has existed in our state for that long and longer. Um, and then locally, we use General Hardwoods, which is on the east side of Detroit um, over, I believe, on McNichols near Mound. Um, and they've been around, again, for a very long time. Um, it's a family-owned business. Both businesses are family-owned businesses. And, and, you know, I like the aspect of being able to just go to them talk to them they've both watched my business grow they've been supportive of me they make sure i can get access to good material that i need at like reasonable prices so that i can both make sure that i can stay in business and also like pass on that savings to customers as best that i can I love that um, you are so supportive of the roots of your family, but also to our uh, communities as well. But with that, about another minute left with you here on the Megacast. You're young. What advice would you give to other people who maybe are, are you know, I don't want to say turning their backs, but I'm sure you had a path when you went into engineering at the University of Michigan, but then decided to do this change in your life. What advice would you give to other people you know I, I i gave a speech to my the graduating class of my high school in jackson um a few years ago and i was nervous uh to be up in front of all these high school students but i was like i just kind of rambled blacked out for a little while but i was like rambling about um 
figure out what you want to do, you know, like just try things. Like I was very much so pushed towards engineering because I was very good in mathematics. And, you know, that was kind of impressed upon me in a way. And I don't fault anyone for that. But I think the most important thing to do is to try and figure out what you like and then reach out to people that do that and reach out to people that are older, that have experience. And then you can say, hey, can I shadow you? Can I work for you? Can I, how can I like engage with this thing that I think that I like and spend like, I mean, invest like a couple weeks, a week, two um, months of your life, which is going to set you up for the rest of your life. And if you don't like it, then you can try something else, but like reach out to people because generally people that are older, people that are experienced, they want to share the information that they have and they're like knowledgeable and they're caring and like, it's the best opportunity to try something without going full bore for like four years of college and beyond. And then being like, meh, maybe I should make furniture with my life. (laughs) (laughs) Quickly, we're running out of time. What's your website? Now, my website is huntandnoyer.com. That's H-U-N-T-A-N-D-N-O-Y-E-R. And my business name comes from the amalgamation of my parents' last names, which is Huntoon and Denoyer. And Denoyer is French, and it means of the walnut tree. So I thought that was pretty important to include in my business name to pay homage to both my parents. Well, thank you so much for taking time to be with us. Great conversation, and we wish you the best of luck. That's going to wrap it up for the Monday edition of the Megacast.